So today in computational finance, applied mathematical finance, I like to discuss a little bit the Levenberg Marquardt optimizer. So a numerical method to well solve a minimization problem. And yeah, maybe you ask KK, okay, why are we now doing that? I mean, I could just use some optimizer from a mathematical library from an American methods library. And well, in the lecture, two aspects are that, first of all, I would like to have it self-contained. You know? So all the methods should be there and you should maybe see all, also all numerical methods needed to solve all of our problems. And our problem, our motivation is the calibration for which we need some minimizer. And then I believe it's also important to have a good intuition, what is this algorithm doing? So I always try to give you some intuition on what's going on. Because sometimes when you then calibrate the model by using such an American message, such an optimizer from some library, uh, you see that, okay, it converges slowly uh, or it doesn't converge as you like, yeah, or it doesn't even find a solution. And then it's really important to understand what's the meaning of the parameters and what is the algorithm doing. So it's, it's important to understand such an algorithm. Okay, and it, as an example, I have the popular levenberg Markward optimizer here and of course the motivation that we look at this is our model calibration so we talked about model calibration before so we had this large section here on for example calibrating our term structure model and our term structure model had many parameters yeah just remember uh, volatility parameters i mean it was a um, uh, or the covariance uh, uh, matrix, it was a matrix and that matrix could depend on time. Yeah, I mean, you can easily have 100, 200, 400 different parameters. I mean, you should reduce the parameters using functional forms, we discussed this, but then if you reduce the parameter, it's maybe not so easy to find the correct parameter because you have a complicated functional form creating this structure and you have to use a numerical method to find the optimal solution. So here on that slide was the procedure. So we have as an input, a high dimensional vector of model parameters. And then there is some black box. So some function that gives us here the model valuation and compares it to the to the target value, the market value, and we would like to just minimize this guy. So we would like to minimize here the, the error. And an algorithm that allows this is here our levenberg marquardt uh, algorithm. So I use <clears throat> a slightly uh, yeah, more simplified notation. So this has now nothing to do with our uh, model parameters. It's just minimizing here a function. So the parameters here come from an n-dimensional space. So x is now my model parameter in Rn. And I have a vector of functions that depend on this x. So I have a function here, f that maps from Rn, my n-dimensional parameter space, to the Rm. So I have an m-dimensional vector. So j here from one to m, fj. And you can think of these as being, for example, the financial product valued with your model. 
And these should match given target values. So I have given target values, say yj, so this is here my target value. And I would like to minimize the distance of f of x and the y, so in vector. So if you think of the L2 norm, so I would like to minimize here the difference of f of x, fj of x and yj squared sum over all those functions or financial products j from one to m. So that corresponds to this problem when you take here the L2 norm. Yeah? So minimize this is the L2 norm. Yeah, you could also minimize the square of the L2 norm, which is then here this, this guy. So, and I would like to find now the argument x star that minimizes this distance. So of course you can consider other norms, but this optimizer here is specifically for actually here the square, yeah, the, the L2 norm. So given a function f from Rn to Rm, we like to here determine the minimum of y minus f of x, or the argument for which y minus f of x in the L2 norm becomes minimal. Okay, so first step, um, I introduce here the notation of a scalar product. So instead of writing here, sum j from one to m, yj minus fj of x squared, I just write here y minus f of x, scalar product with y minus f of x. So, and if you like, you can also write this as y minus f of x. Okay, so this is a vector, yeah? So this is an m vector, x is of rn, y and f map to rm. So this is an m vector, so I take transpose here times y minus f of x. So I like to minimize here this function s. And the main idea is now that I approximate this function s. Well, is for a fixed x. So I have a fixed point x here and some shift delta x. I approximate now the function that maps delta x to s of x plus delta x by some function s tilde. And the approximation I'm doing is a linearization. Okay, but I'm not linearizing, linearizing s, I'm linearizing f. So if I have done that, okay, that's the first approximation step, then I like to minimize the approximate function. So the next step is that I then minimize here the approximate function s tilde. So find the best delta x star. So as a function of this delta x, find the best delta x star. And then I repeat this step with the new x. And the hope is that as I approach the minimum of s, then this linearization is always updating. So um, the error that I make by this linearization is actually not such a big problem. Maybe also if I go in small steps. Yeah? So here this linearization, so this approximation for that to be okay. Yeah, maybe the uh, step that I use should be, should be small. Okay, the approximation that I do is that I perform a linearization, a first order approximation for f. So f of x plus delta x, so add my 
point after the shift with delta x is f of x plus df by dx times delta x. And now these, this is a function from Rn to Rm. So the J is the Jacobian matrix. Okay, so maybe I can write this here. So I have here a df1 by dx1. Okay, and then it goes here to df m by dx1 and so on df1 by dxn and the dfm by dxn. Okay, so if I multiply this with a column vector delta x, yeah, so everybody gets its component, its shift. So this is now the approximation that I use in the function s. So my function s is s of x plus delta x. Okay, now I write this with my scalar product. This is just y minus f of x plus delta x, the norm of that. Okay, so the distance of f of x at the shifted argument from the target value. Uh, and now I plug in my approximation. So using here my approximation, this is that part here, instead of the f of x plus delta x, I just have f of x plus j delta x. And this now defines my approximate function S tilde, which is now a function of two arguments, my starting point. So I have here my X, which enters into the point where I evaluate the function. It also, of course, enters here into the point where I evaluate the derivative. And now a free or another free parameter, which is here, my delta X. So it depends on X, which enters into the function and the derivative and the delta X, uh, yeah, which is then here appearing multiplied with the derivative. So you see that this guy is not a linear function in delta x. Yeah? So I did not linearize the s, I linearized the f, and the result is that I still have a quadratic function in the delta x. Nice thing is that this intermediate question now, yeah? so find the minimizing delta x for this function s tilde, so now minimize S tilde as a function of delta S. I keep X fixed. Yeah? So this can be solved analytically. So what do I need to do? Okay, I need to differentiate the S tilde with respect to the delta S. So if you think that this is here, this vector transposed times this vector, then the derivative is just, okay, differentiate this guy with respect to delta x. This is just the minus j transposed multiplied with this vector. And I have everything twice. So I have two j transposed y minus f of x minus j of delta x. And I would like to find the minimum. So I set this to zero. And by the way, I believe there's a minus missing, but setting it to zero doesn't matter. So let me put here a minus in front there. Because there is, if I differentiate here, this guy, there's a minus here. <clears throat> okay, so now let's uh, multiply this out. Yeah? So I have, uh, the two can go away. So I have J transposed times Y minus F of X minus 
j transposed j delta x. So I have here these two terms. There is the j transposed multiplied with y minus f of x, which is this part here, minus the j transposed multiplied with j delta x, which is that part here. Okay, that means the minimizing delta x has to solve this equation here. j transpose j delta x is equal j transpose y minus f of x. Okay, that's may, uh, very similar to what you do for a linear regression. Yeah? Actually, it's just the linear regression equation. Um, so some of you maybe uh, remember that from the session we had on this in a numerical methods lecture, but here you have it again. So now just invert J transpose J and we have found the optimal uh, solution Delta X that is minimizing our approximation. Okay, we are just minimizing the approximation. So it's not clear if this is also the minimizer here for our S uh, in, in case that S is just, or F was a linear function, then of course this is the true solution. So then we just repeat this step with the new X plus Delta X. Uh, so we, we use X plus Delta X as the new value for X and we iterate. So that means I have to recalculate the function evaluation and I also have to recalculate the derivative at the new point and I repeat the minimization of this approximation, which is now a new approximation. A small problem is that it is not clear that I can calculate the inverse of this guy. So does this inverse exist? So can I solve this equation? And for this problem, uh, there is the Tikhonov re regularization. So it may be that our matrix J transpose J is not invertible or small. So we have maybe some bad condition. <coughs> In that case, we can use the Tikhonov regularization and I just make the matrix that is in front of the delta X invertible by adding lambda times the identity. And if I make lambda large enough, the matrix will be invertible. Uh, so it will dominate the J transpose J uh, if it is large enough and I can calculate the inverse. Maybe I come back to this thing later because that's a bit strange. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm just adding here this term. And if I then solve this, I'm not solving the correct problem. Yeah? So I have modified the problem. So that is the algorithm. So the leonberg marquardt algorithm solves in each iteration. Okay, so now there are two versions. There's the Levenberg algorithm. It solves in each iteration exactly this system. And there's another small modification to this algorithm where we replace here this identity with the diagonal matrix of J transpose J. And this is then the levenberg marquardt algorithm. So it solves the system where this regularization gets this additional multiplicative part that I multiply with the diagonal matrix of J transpose J.
Well, J transposed J. Okay, so this is the matrix where I multiply here a column with maybe some other column. And the diagonal matrix of J transpose J is just the norm of this vector. Uh, it could happen that this entry is zero. Yeah? So if the derivative of say um, a function, so that's just one, um, one component of my function. So FK, if the gradient of that guy is zero, then the J transpose J will be zero. So it's not safe to just multiply here with the J transpose J, the diagonal matrix, because that would not make this equation solvable. It could be that the diagonal uh, element is zero and I would like to add something different from zero to make it solvable. So there is a small additional thing here. So this matrix, so the guy here is, I had, I have added here some star, diagonal star. So this guy is the diagonal matrix of J transpose J. If the diagonal element is non-zero and otherwise I just use one. Okay, that's the algorithm. I will discuss uh, the choice here of the lambda, maybe a little bit later, yeah? So I have to choose the lambda such that it makes this linear system here solvable. Uh, but there is now a nice interpretation of this algorithm. And this goes a little bit back here to our regularization. So I just add this plus lambda identity. Okay, and why is solving this problem still okay for my original problem that I would like to minimize this function? And to understand this, let's look at uh, say the limit cases. So the first limit case is that J transpose J is zero. So what's going on then? So we just look at the Liebenberg version. So we are looking at J transpose J plus lambda I delta X is J transposed Y minus F of X. So if J transpose J is zero, so I have that this guy here is not there, lambda times identity. So I just can divide by lambda. So my delta X is just one divided by lambda J transposed Y minus F of X. And now you see that this is just the gradient descent method. Okay, so this is just a classical gradient descent step. And the lambda is just a dampening. So you go into the direction of the gradient. Yeah? So this guy here is my gradient. The lambda is just controlling the step size. So you make a smaller step for larger lambda. So I also have now a nice interpretation of this lambda parameter. Well, let's recall shortly the gradient descent method. Yeah? So if you, if you look up the gradient descent method, okay, that's now, um, the formulation, if you have a function from Rn to R, 
So I have here the formulation for the gradient descent for a function from Rn to R. So that means I look now at the original problem of minimizing the L2 norm, so of minimizing S of X. So if I formulate the gradient descent with respect to the original, original problem that I would like to minimize the L2 norm of Y minus F of X, then the gradient descent method, okay, if you look it up, it's the next value is the previous value minus some gamma times the gradient. Okay, if you now think of that you have chosen a basis, then the gradient is a row vector, so I added some transpose there. Okay, so you go into the direction of the gradient. And sometimes this parameter gamma here is called, well, for example, in machine learning, yeah, it's called the learning rate. Yeah. And you see that this is just our method because if you take the gradient of this guy, then this is just two times y minus f of x times minus the derivative of x, so minus j. And now if you take the transpose of this, then you see this is j transposed times y minus f of x. So for the first case, yeah, where j transpose j is zero, and I add this term, plus lambda identity, I see that we get the gradient descent method. And now we have that our lambda, well, one divided by lambda corresponds to the parameter gamma, the learning rate in the gradient descent method. So if J transpose J is zero, Actually, what we are having here is just the gradient descent method and this lambda will control the step size. So what we have is that large lambda means that the method becomes more like gradient descent with smaller step size. So adding a large lambda just means that I'm going slower and I'm going more in the direction of the gradient. So you see that adding this lambda, doing this regularization, even with a large lambda for our optimization problem, it's not something wrong. It's not getting more wrong. Yeah? The algorithm is just getting slower we are just getting a gradient descent method that is slow. Yeah? We always go in the uh, direction of the gradient. Of course, the point is here that I'm iterating this procedure. And so I'm always calcul calculating a new derivative and updating the gradient. So now let's look at the other case. The other case is now the case where the J transpose J is invertible then I do not need the lambda to make the matrix, um, to invert the matrix. So let's consider the case lambda equals zero. So what's the method then? Okay, in that case, I can invert the J transpose J. And the solution of my problem is delta X is J transpose J inverse, J transpose times Y minus F of X. And this is just yeah, a little bit yeah, like a classical Newton step. So let's look at this part. So what is the Newton's method? Well, maybe you know the Newton's method for root finding. So finding where a function is zero, but okay, go, going to the derivative, yeah, um, finding the minimum is like, finding the root of the derivative, you can also formulate the Newton's method to minimize a function. 
So instead of the function, I have the derivative. Instead of the first derivative in the root finder method, I have the second derivative. So here's Newton's method for optimization. Also now written down, I like to minimize a function f that goes from rn to r. So again, my function f of x here is my s of x. So my y minus f of x norm squared. Okay, then Newton's method is the new x is the previous x minus the inverse of the second derivative multiplied with the gradient. So that means delta x is minus second derivative of f inverse multiplied with the gradient. So I also go in the direction of the gradient, but now the step size is a little bit controlled by the second derivative. So you can think a little bit of this as follows. So this guy takes the role of the parameter gamma in the gradient descent. So in the gradient descent, I had a similar expression and now I have here, instead of this gamma, I have the inverse of the second derivative. So which means that if the second derivative, so actually it's the Haskin matrix, is small, then this corresponds to the gradient does not change too much. So that means I maybe can take a larger step because the whole thing remains in this direction for a longer time. So I can take a larger step. Uh, or put differently, if the second derivative is large, you know, then be careful the gradient is changing. So take a smaller step. Yeah, first of all, uh, let's check that what we are doing for lambda equals zero and j transpose j invertible is this, actually it's like this. Yeah. So for the for the for the Hessian, yeah. So what I like to do is calculate f double prime. So what I differentiate is y minus f of x, yeah. So this distance, so this is my f of x uh, squared, and I'm differentiating this twice. So what I get is the first derivative is two times. Well, the derivative of f, so this is the f prime multiplied with the y minus f of x. Well, with a minus, if you like. Um, then I have to differentiate this again. So what I get then is two times f prime of x times f prime of x. Okay, so this is differentiating the second part of the product. Minus two times second derivative of f of x times y minus f of x. Okay, so I did not use the matrix notation here, but actually this part here is our j transposed J. So you see that the Haskin in the Newton's method is not what we are doing. 
we are taking instead of the second derivative, we are taking here J transpose J, where J is the first derivative, the Jacobi matrix. And this is also a good thing in our algorithm because calculating the deriv derivative is maybe uh, expensive. Um, and you see that I have to calculate the derivative. Here's the gradient. I have to do that. But if I now have to calculate the Hessian, the second derivative in addition, it's maybe even more expensive. So what we are doing is we are now approximating this. So I'm approximating this with just this first part, the J transpose J. I'm approximating the Hessian with this part because, well, the thing is I like to minimize this distance. So this is small. So this guy is small. If we like to minimize y minus f of x. Okay, so I can leave this part here out. So now we have a nice picture for J transpose J invertible and the lambda chosen to be zero. Our method is an approximated Newton's method where we approximate the Hessian by the J transpose J. Of course, our method is still the optimization problem where we uh, approximate the S by S tilde and then find the true solution. But now with this regularization, we have a nice interpretation. So let's go back to this slide, yeah, discussing here the interpretation of this regularization. So you see for the two cases, lambda equals zero. So that's here the case, lambda equals zero. Our method is a Newton-like uh, method where the J transpose J is approximating the Hessian. And if I perform the regularization, so if I add lambda, then lambda is more and more dominating and the J transpose J is more and more yeah, uh, unimportant. Yeah? So it's not no, no longer so important. So if you consider J transpose J to zero, then this method will look like gradient descent. So the algorithm can be seen as an interpolation of a gradient descent method and a Newton's step. So we have gradient descent for large lambda and we have a Newton-like step for small lambda. So now you see that this regularization, which I just motivated by, okay, let's make the matrix invertible, actually has a very nice interpretation. So the numerical algorithm is an interpolation of two algorithms that should uh, converge, yeah? so that, that uh, try to solve the original problem. And you know that the gradient descent for a very large lambda, so for a very small step size is slow. So I like to have a very small lambda to become as Newton-like as I can. So I will now adapt this lambda such that I can still invert the matrix, but the lambda should be small. So the algorithm now is adaptive. So in every iteration step, I try to adapt uh, the lambda. So first of all, if J transpose J is invertible, then maybe I don't need the number, uh, the lambda. Um, then I will just check if the method will lead to an improvement. So if the new value is, if I plug it in into y minus f of x, so if I plug the x plus delta x into that, so I calculate y minus f of x plus delta x. So if that is an improvement, then everything is nice. Yeah, And 
I take the new point and I decrease the lambda. So if everything is fine, so that means the matrix is invertible and the new value is an improvement, then I decrease the lambda. But you also know that the Newton's method can have this problem that you go too fast and you are not converging, yes, you are shooting um, over your, your, your um, minimum. Yeah? Um, so if I observe that the new value is not an improvement, so then maybe my step size is too large, then um, I will make lambda larger, which makes the step size smaller. So if I make the, if I see that the new point is not an improvement, I will increase lambda. And of course, also, if I observe that the matrix J transpose J plus lambda I is not invertible. So maybe, maybe here there should be, there should be J transpose J plus lambda I. So if I find then a new point that is an improvement, well, I make the lambda then smaller because I maybe like to go a little bit faster, but I have to recalculate the derivative J at the new point. Okay, I, I, I have another remark, but let me first summarize now the algorithm. Okay, the algorithm that is including uh, this adaptive change to the number now goes like that. So we initialize here our lambda to some initial value. We calculate at the initial starting point. So we also have here some initial starting point. We calculate there our function and the derivative, the Jacobian matrix. Then the next step is that we solve our linear problem. So if the solution exists, so the problem is solvable. And if the new point is an improvement, so the new point being an improvement means that our original function s, the distance of y minus f of x L2 norm, uh, is at the new point smaller than s, so the error is smaller. Then I take the point. So then I take the point and I will adapt the lambda. So I will also make the lambda smaller. And I now repeat at step two. So I go back here to step two. So I recalculate the function and the derivative at the new point. So if this is not the case, so either if I cannot invert the matrix, so if the solution does not exist, or if the new point is not an improvement, so in the gradient descent picture, I have gone too, too uh, fast. Yeah? So if these, two conditions, so one of the these two conditions are fulfilled, then I make the lambda larger and I repeat at step three. Yeah? So I have not calculated a new point, so I can go back to step three, just try to solve the, the linear equation with this new value. So you see that this guy here is the expensive part. Yeah? So this is the expensive part. Calculating the function. If you think, for example, that the function is now a Monte Carlo simulation that evaluates financial products, and you think that this derivative here is calculating derivatives by finite differences. So bumping in each direction, if I have multiple parameters, it means as many function evaluations as I have parameters. Yeah, if I just use one-sided finite differences. So this stuff is really the um, expensive part. So I do not need to do that step. Yeah, if the um, 
linear equation is not solvable, yeah, I still have the same uh, Hessian approximation and uh, Jacobi matrix. The algorithm then stops, yeah, if um, the improvement is only very small or if you believe that your solution is your your minimum is close enough to zero so one last remark so this looks a little bit strange i mean i have maybe now a very nice motivation why we are adding the plus lambda i because it will make the matrix invertible. And we also have a nice interpretation why this is not harmful to our original problem because it's just an interpolation of a Newton's method. And uh, if we have, if we add larger lambdas, we are not moving away to something else. We are moving just to creating descent method, which also works, but it's slow. Um, so we have a nice interpretation of this, but why do we have here the modification the, that we multiply with this diagonal element? And well, uh, if this is just a one dimensional um, equation, then it's not such a big, big thing because I just rescale the lambda. I give the lambda a different interpretation. But if I have maybe an n-dimensional and larger than one problem, I use here different rescalings for different coordinates x. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I can give you a good intuition for this, but sometimes a very nice thing is to think of these things as being physical quantities. Yeah. For example, for example, think of x being in the units of say meters so some position or whatever and f in the unit joule so maybe it's an it's an uh, in it's an energy yeah. and you would like to minimize the energy potential or whatever so then um, if you look at the equation, so my equation is so delta x equals in the gradient descent formulation one divided by lambda j transposed y minus f of x then the physical units, yeah, so of this guy here, this has the units of energy, so the joules, the J transposed J, well, the J, uh, sorry, the J transpose is the DF by DX. So it has the units joule divided by meters. Okay, and this guy here is a difference in my position. So it has the unit meters. So you see that the lambda or the one divided by lambda in order to make this, that, that this makes sense. Okay, on the right-hand side, I now see joule times joule divided by meter. I would like to have meter. So this means that the one divided by lambda is meter squared divided by joule squared. So this guy is meter squared divided by joule squared. So you see that somehow this scaling lambda has an interpretation, has a knowledge on the scale. 
I mean, if I would use now kilometers, it would have a different meaning. Yeah? If my scale X would be on, on a different unit, it would be kilometers, it would be a different meaning. I would have a different lambda. And now you see that in the interpretation where you just have the Newton's method. So maybe I remove here the lambda and I write gamma like in the gradient descent. So I also write here the gamma. So the gamma in the gradient descent, if we move to the Newton's method, that's the gamma in the gradient descent. If I now move to the Newton's method, I have that the gamma is one divided by the Hessian, but this is just here my first derivative squared. So if I divide by J transpose J, I'm multiplying with meter squared divided by joule squared. Yeah? So in this interpretation here, the unit of J transposed is energy divided by meters. Yeah? So I have that the unit of the J transpose J is joules divided by meter. So it's energy divided by meter squared. So you see that this is exactly what you need to make the X uh, to the unit of meters. So this scaling here makes the lambda unitless. Uh, so in case that you have, for example, components in the X where one component is in kilometers and the other component is in meters, you have some mixing of the scales and the lambda actually tells you if you should go fast or slow, but fast or slow in the unit of your problems. And since I just have one lambda, I would have some balancing of these uh, speeds in the individual components of the X. So that's, uh, that's just maybe some rough idea. So why uh, one could do this rescaling. But of course, one has the problem that this uh, rescaling with the square of the uh, first derivative could become zero. And so we need some kind of uh, fallback. Yeah, okay. I hope that this is maybe uh, some, gives you some intuition. Okay, so to finish this uh, session, let's have a look at some code and try a little bit uh, to also to use this algorithm for our calibration problem. So you find a code of this Levenberg Marquardt algorithm in our here financial mathematics library. Yeah, so we find here a class Levenberg Marquardt where you can play around and you can use this to solve some problems. And in our um, experiments project, yeah, there's also some um, uh, test, yeah, I believe hmm, the class is called Levenberg Marquardt test. Okay, where where you can where you can try this a little bit out. So <clears throat> let's do some experiments. So first, maybe let's run this unit test and also run this small um, experiment. So before we run the experiments, let's have a look at the code. So it's under the package optimizer. There is an implementation of this algorithm. So you also find some documentation. So we solve here the problem. Delta X is H lambda inverse J transposed F. Yeah, so here, uh, I just minimize the function f, yeah? so the y is equal to zero. That's not a problem. And the h lambda is the j transpose lambda i, so j transpose j plus lambda i, or the j transpose j plus lambda i 
the diagonal matrix. Okay, so um, yeah, the constructor allows to set the initial parameters, the target values, the iterations, and so on. And you can also set some weights if you like. And this class has an abstract method. So you should just overwrite here this function. And this is our function f. So the function that maps these parameters to this, these values. Yeah? So you will get called with uh, this method here and you get your parameters here and you should write the values there. Um, you can also overwrite the derivative function. So this is our j. Yeah? You can implement this if you know the j analytically. So if you do not know the j analytically, he will calculate this with a finite difference. Yeah, So he will just call your function that calculates the values uh, multiple times with small finite difference shifts. Okay, yeah, so you see here, he's calculating the derivatives for different shift vectors. Yeah? So he's calculating uh, here a shift vector. The new parameter is just the shifted vector and then he's calculating the value. And from that, the derivative via finite difference. So if you do not provide the derivative, it's enough to just provide the function and he will use finite differences to solve, to solve the derivative. This is the criteria that the guy terminates, so the final number of iteration is reached or the change, the improvement is uh, not large enough. Yeah? Or if the lambda parameter has increased to infinity, yeah, then we will also stop. And this is the main code that does the iterations. Yeah? So here is the iteration count and he's calling here the function that is taking this parameter, calculating the values. You have to provide this function from the outside. Then he's calculating the S at the new point. Yeah? So this is our root mean square error uh, or we can drop the root, yeah, it's enough to minimize the square. So this is the squared of the norm and this is our error. If the new point is uh, an improvement, uh, then we take the new point, we indicate that the derivative matrix, the J has to be recalculated and we decrease the lambda. So these were the step. If this guy here is not an improvement, um, I'm increasing here the lambda. So then um, I will update my um, parameters. So my, my, my um, data. So this is done in the another function, which is here. And this function is looking if we need to recalculate the Hessian. So actually our Hessian approximation. So we, we have the derivative. So if the derivative needs to be recalculated, we first recalculate it. And if not, I can reuse the J. So that's here just recalculate the J if it's needed. So if not, we can reuse the J and here I build the matrix J transpose J well plus lambda I yeah, with the regularization. So you see this here is just this, the J transpose J, the uh, corresponding derivative elements yeah, over all elements here. Um, and this here is if it is the diagonal element, then I either just add lambda or I multiply with one plus lambda, which is the same as adding lambda times 
uh, the diagonal element of the Hessian. So then I have built the Hessian, then I built the right-hand side. The right-hand side is J transposed. So this here is the J, the derivative times Y minus F. Uh, so this here is the calculation of the J transposed Y minus F. And I solve, I use some linear algebra, I solve this um, linear equation uh, um, to calculate the new delta X. So that's, that's the algorithm. So you can peek inside this. And if you have problems with the calibration, yeah, sometimes it's maybe nice to just stop here and check what's going on. So for example, you can set some breakpoint here and you can run your calibration or there's also um, a unit test that is running some tests on this guy. And um, here's a unit test. So you can just run this now in debug mode. Okay, so I had a breakpoint here on the top. So now I'm here in the algorithm in the run method. Let's jump to the next breakpoint. So that was the breakpoint that I entered. So then we stop here at the breakpoint. So here, the Hessian is invalid. We have to recalculate the Hessian. You can have a look at the derivatives that we have calculated. Okay. And you can now step through this and check what your uh, optimizer is doing. Another nice thing to check what the optimizer is doing is to look at some log output. And let me show that to you in the other project. So here in our experiments project, I also have a small experiments that runs here some tests on the Levenberg Marquardt algorithm. So I have a small linear system that I have to solve. Or I have the Rosen Rosenbrock function. So maybe let's have a look at the Rosenbrock function. So the Rosenbrock function is here. Um, actually, I have a function that maps from R2 to R2. So I have two parameters. My initial parameters are x1 is one half, x2 is one half. And I have two functions, f1 and f2. My target value is 0, 0 for f1 and f2. And um, the first function f1 is 100 times x2 minus x1 squared. And the second function f2 is 1 minus x1. And actually the Rosenbrock function is just 100 times x2 minus x1 squared squared plus 1 minus x1 squared, which is just the square of the norm of this vector here. Um, and the optimal solution is actually here this one. Yeah, so you see this will be zero if this is one. Yeah, and um, that guy here, one times one. So one, one is a solution. Okay, so you can pass here the initial value target values as arguments to the constructor and you perform an overriding of the function. So you see this is like an, anonymous in a class, I'm constructing the abstract class and I'm providing the in in implementation of the function here in line. Okay, then you can run the optimizer and you can ask him for the best uh, parameters. So let's, for example, let's run this here. Okay, and you see some output, for example, here for our Rosenbrock function with initial value one half, one half, we require 25 iteration. Uh, we have best accuracy, machine precision, and we get the right solution, which is the one, one. If you use a different initial value for the same function, you know, this is here minus one, one, then you see it can take significantly more time yeah, because this function has some 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 curvature and um, 
so we also hit the solution yeah and the accuracy is also machine precision maybe as a small um yeah, additional remark you can see the uh, individual step of this solver by uh, switching on the logging so if you go to the code you see that there is oops so there is some logging going on so in every iteration we are writing to a log what's going on and to switch this on you see the log level is here fine to switch this on you have to define the log level so there is a file logging properties here in this project where you can specify the log level to be fine so then you see the log level uh, then you see all the printout that corresponds to this log level but i have to tell him that he should use this file so the logging properties file doing the run and to do that okay so there is a remark on the script here so you can enable the logging in this project by setting this option here well, you have to set this option in the virtual machine parameters in the VM option. So if you like to do this, you go to run configurations. There you can say that you would like to run this program here with certain arguments. And now I add the argument that was on the slide. So this is um, Java util logging so i just have the simple logging framework config file so and i have to point him to this file so if you provide this parameter i believe you should print out some log information so maybe to make the output a little bit less uh, i have other functions here let's just look at these two guys and run this again so let's run this again. Okay, so the first run required uh, not so many. Um, yeah, okay, this exception is just because I do not have attached a, a logger um, to the port, but that's not a problem. So, um, the first one didn't require so many iterations. It was 25, I believe. Okay, yeah. So this was the 25 iterations. And you now can see what he's doing with the lambda parameter. So you see he makes the lambda smaller here from step to step. So that means he is always finding a better solution. Yeah, you have some kind of convergence. Yeah? So actually from here to here, it's not improving yeah? and the lambda is shortly increasing. So he's going a little bit slower and, and also here, he's not improving, he's going a little bit slower, but then he is decreasing the lambda. So he is again going faster. Huh? So here is, he is also again going a little bit slower from there to there. So he is always adapting the lambda and trying to find um, a good solution. So 25 iterations, that, that's, that's, that's quite fast. If you start at the other initial value, though so the minus one minus, uh, the minus one one, uh, then, um, okay, you see that he has some problems. Okay, he makes the lambda larger. Yeah? So until, uh, so you see there's no improvement here until he gets, um, to, to the point where he has some improvement. So he has much slower convergence, yeah. but then in the end, he's also finding the solution. Yeah? So he's trying to adapt the Lambda to go faster when he can go faster. So maybe at this point, let me draw a small uh, picture to conclude here with this interpolation of um, so what's the lambda is doing yeah if you have 
a if you like to minimize a function, yeah, say the minimum is here. So, and these are now the lines where you have, um, where the function is constant. Yeah? So these are the line where the function is constant. So the ISO, the ISO lines. Yeah? Then um, you can draw maybe a picture here like that. Yeah? And maybe the lines go like that. So, and if this here is now your starting point, so this here is your starting point, then the gradient would be orthogonal to the This here is the gradient. Uh, so this here is the gradient of F. This is orthogonal to um, to the actually it's minus the gradient. Uh, this is orthogonal to the constant line to the ISO lines. So this would be the gradient descent method. So this is the gradient descent method going in that direction. But the Newton's method knows something about the curvature, yeah. So the Newton's method knows something about the curvature, and it would then say, okay, go immediately to say that point. Yeah? So it would take me to that point. It goes a little bit better into this direction, and the lambda is then a bit deciding on where we go here in this interval. So it's a little bit changing to more gradient descent or to more Newton-like. Yeah? So the direction is not uh, becoming completely wrong. It's just maybe not the optimal uh, direction. So that's what our lambda is doing. So last remark, uh, you saw that I can enable here this logging. And um, we had in the previous session, our big calibration exercise. So there was our calibration exercise of the interest rate model. Okay, so where is that? That is here, for example, this uh, calibration experiment. So you can now run that one. And you can also run now that one with the logging enabled. So now I have enable to the logging, okay, just with the same parameter. And you see now he's calibrating here our model to volatilities and you can see how the parameter change and how he's um, finding finding the solution. Yeah, now with this optimizer. Yeah? So maybe you remember that we had here this brute force Monte Carlo calibration or the analytic calibration. Uh, and you can you can you can see the, the log output. And the surprising thing is that actually he is finding the solution really fast. Yeah. So you see he's starting with a large lambda here. He is making the lambda very quickly small. Uh, so he is making the lambda smaller in every step. Uh, he is going to, to a Newton method and then he just needs a single step and he is he's he's there yeah so you see that the root mean square is already with a few steps it's quite in a nice region yeah and then he stops okay so maybe you can play with this that was it for today thank you